Welcome to another episode of The Postscript, uh, Living Faith Bible Institute's weekly podcast and YouTube series where we interview pastors and professors from the Bible Institute, pick their brain, try to, to learn from them and their ministry experiences, uh, as well as, as talk about the Bible and theological issues that we find in the Word of God. And so today I, I have the privilege and the honor of interviewing a dear friend of mine, um, Pastor Mark Trotter. And uh, we're going to be having a conversation today just about his ministry, about his life, um, and uh, what he, how God has brought him to where he is today. And he's got a lot to share, and uh, so we're going to get right into it. Pastor Mark Trotter, it's good to see you, man. <laughs> hey, it's a thrill to be here, and I'm glad to be able to hang out with you, man. Well, we do this usually over the phone or texting, that's true. And we so, don't get to see you very often. Yeah, so now we get to do this in yeah. front of the camera. Yeah, so you, uh, you're you living in uh, Georgia now. Yeah, suburb of Atlanta. So you're you're at uh, One Baptist. Yes, sir. And um, before we talk about ministry and life at One Baptist in Malawi, we'll get there. Uh, but just so the people who are listening maybe don't know you very well, uh, maybe they've heard you preach or maybe they have no idea, um, will you share with us just a little bit about your testimony in Christ uh, and how you came to, to, to a saving knowledge of Jesus, and then just what God has done in your life in ministry. Give us a snapshot of that. Okay, the snapshot. I'm not good at snapshots. Well, do, but do your best. Yeah. It's a 30-minute show, so. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, and, and I w I'll give you the, the Reader's Digest version of coming to Christ. Uh, I, I grew up in Miami, Florida. And uh, I'm the youngest of four kids, and I don't like to think of myself as the baby of the family. I, I would ask my siblings when they were alive if, if I played that card, and they said I didn't. So anyway, but I'm the youngest of four. Uh, before I was born, and about the time that I was born, my, my parents, they had gotten saved. My brothers and sisters had recollection of going to church, but by the my recollective years, uh, and I never knew what happened. My parents are both gone. I never knew just what it was, but something happened that got them out of church. So by the time I could recall, um, my home was uh, like every lost person's home that you could imagine and my dad would come home half loot every day mm. uh, uh, you know I, in a weird set of circumstances I, I answered the phone one night late about the same time that my dad did in the other and he didn't know I was on the other end and so I'm finding out yeah my dad's seeing stuff somebody you else yeah stuff yeah. you wouldn't want to know as a young man yeah and so you know just a whacked out situation and so uh I was a sophomore uh in high school and uh um, through a strange set of circumstances, this guy uh, invites me to church. He kind of had uh, had me over a barrel to get there <laughs> and uh, didn't want to be there. The first time I went, man, it was the craziest thing in the world. I thought it was the most boring thing that I had, had ever endured in my life and I thought to myself I don't know how people was do this like this. a youth ministry thing or? well uh it was yeah it was a youth ministry thing and I, I went with my best friend I I, I kind of had him over a barrel to come with me right. and uh so it was just kind of whack there was you know girls on this side and boys on this side and we were way too cool for that sure. and uh and so yeah it was just it was so weird mm. to me and i was like i ain't never going back to that man but my name got on the roll uh, i visited and this was a baptist church yeah they were and they were aggressive you know <laughs> and so uh they kept working me man every thursday night at this visitation thing that they had and you know every week i'm like ah you know i think my grandmother's gonna die this week and, <laughs> you know i i'm, I'm not gonna be there and uh, so again through a, another crazy set of circumstances about six months later i find myself back 
at this church. And I sat there and my attention was riveted. I mean, I was hanging on every word. I was, the guy speaking, I'm like, oh my word, man, this dude knows me. You know, he's right. calling me out, you know? And uh, wow, yeah, I mean, God was just in the midst of drawing me to his son at that point. And, you know, I, I look back on it now, I couldn't have de described it then, but that's Second Corinthians uh, uh, 4, 4, the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine into mm. them. And boy, the blinders were up that first time that I came. And uh, praise the Lord for just that crazy set of circumstances that caused me to go back. And uh, so it, it took me about uh, six weeks, but every week, man, I, I walked out of there knowing, okay, I'm going to get saved. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there was uh, one Sunday, uh, you know, and, you know, I was a street urchin. And, sure, I get that. Uh, long hair, you know, oh, all yeah, of this. Awful. Terrible. Terrible. You know, thing. those people long that have long hair. hair. In fact, we need to get into that story, okay, after, <laughs> <laughs> after we get right. into this. So... Um, I was on the last row of the balcony. Uh, my best friend was with me again, and this dude was preaching. And, you know, Mr. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I mean, by the time he was done, I was literally trembling wow. at the power of the gospel, man. Uh, so he did the every head bowed, every eye closed thing. And uh, my best friend says, dude, you go in. And I'm like, I'm out of here, man. And so, uh, you know, that, that was the public invitation sure, thing. I went forward, called on the name of the Lord. And, um, the next day, man, was toting my Bible to school. It was a kind of a inner city school. And, um, uh, all the brothers started calling me Reverend Trotter from the first day because he's got his Bible, man. Yeah. And at that point, never in a million years would I ever dream that I'd be doing what I'm doing now. Oh, sure. Uh, so that's, yeah, I, it was uh, a radical conversion, got saved. I, you know, certainly, it took me a little bit to unplug from the world system but boy from the get-go i mean that was my plan Your heart was towards it a absolutely so then from that moment i mean obviously the high school years college years you went to you went to seminary didn't you did, how did that how did that work? well uh i actually went to baptist bible college in springfield okay uh and uh, so, you know, back in those days, it was a three-year deal, and you could go for, you know, uh, you know, if 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 you wanted to. And so, my deal was, I was like, okay, I'm going to do the three-year thing, and uh, if uh, if I have an opportunity after that, I'll, you know, see if the Lord's in that, and I'll take it, and if not, I'll go the fourth. So, uh, an opportunity opened up in Southern California. Uh, for me to work with singles uh, back in the day uh, after the three year thing. And so uh, I took that and uh, that's, that's where it began. Uh, I met my wife in Bible college. And uh, so we got married uh, March 4th, 1979. And two weeks later, we were in Huntington Beach, California, working with singles. Uh, I was 22 years old. Right. <laughs> and uh, had been saved like six years at that point. You know, it's kind of crazy for me to think about now. Uh, and Sherry was 20. So we were kids, man. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but, uh, you know, we've had a, a great run. We've had a, you know, a, a lot of weird things that have happened along the yeah, way. Yeah, I want to hear about the weird things <laughs> <laughs> since that since you're bringing that up. But I do want to ask. Okay, so you're in California, uh, and then then you were in Florida, right? Next, uh, you you've kind of moved around the states a lot. I've been a part of several different bodies, but I want to get to New Philly and talk about what God did there. So I'm I'm, I'm headed that direction. But but tell us how God moved you from 
from there uh, through the states and to, even to where you are now. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, uh, so we graduated, moved to Southern California. I was there for three years. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I, I started to find out early on uh, a little behind the scenes of this whole pastoring thing. Yeah, ministry wasn't everything you thought. Yeah, oh, it was so. whack <laughs> to the max. Okay. Uh, so I felt like I was in the fire uh, mm. in in California. Mm. Uh, I wasn't. I was in the frying pan, and then moved to uh, Marietta, Georgia. Okay. And that was the fire. Georgia, yeah, that's right. Yes. Uh, so I like to say that's where I worked for the Antichrist. Wow. Uh, at that place, and so uh, after a year and a half of being there, uh, God opened a door for me to go to New Philadelphia. Uh, I was 26 at that time and came in as the assistant pastor. Um, and so after being there uh, for uh, about five years, uh, the pastor who I had an incredible relationship with, uh, he was the first, after the first week of being in New Philly, uh, I, I came home one day, I'm gonna get choked up talking about it. Um, and I said to Sherry, you know what? We've been in the ministry for almost five years now, and yet this is the first time I actually feel like I'm in the ministry. Mm. Uh, and uh, so, you know, I, I had a cool run with the pastor uh, there, uh, like I said, for about five years. And um, so one, one day, and, and we were very accustomed to going to lunch, me and the pastor, and, uh, so uh, he was not a McDonald's guy. And uh, this particular day, we went through the drive through at McDonald's and went to the little park in New Philadelphia. And uh, I was kind of like, wow, this is, this is weird, but it's kind of cool, you know? Yeah. And so we're just chowing down and, uh, and he says, hey, I, the reason we went to McDonald's and we're at the park today is I wanted to talk with you. Uh, he said, man, God is, is moving me. And uh, and I man, I really would love for you to go with me. Um, he was going to be going to a good sized church in Detroit, and uh, and boy, just immediately my head, you know. And uh, he said, and so I want you to go with me. But he said, I think what the Lord is doing is I think He wants you to be the next guy. Mm. I was thirty one, dude, and. Uh, you know, that the church at that time was like 750. And I, I, I was Sarah, man. I laughed in his face for real. I mean, I, it was, I, there was never a day that had ever entered into my mind that I would one day be the pastor there. And especially at 31. And, uh, so, uh, man, within about a month, that whole thing had actually happened. Uh, wow. And yeah. And how long, how long do you serve as pastor there? Uh, just shy of 20 years as the senior pastor. Okay. So I was there about 25 years. Okay. And that's hard to believe since I'm just 30 right now. <laughs> And I don't know what's funny that about that. Does that joke ever get old? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Do you, uh, so, okay, with that, man, there's, uh, we could have several episodes just talking about um, what, what it was like, you know, uh, leading a, a church for 20 years and just uh, discuss all the ups and downs and things like that. The thing I'm kind of interested in, you know, I've talked about this before, um, and, but I think it's relevant whenever we, I sit down with, pastors that I really respect. I want to ask about how you how you came to know about discipleship. So what when did that concept begin to, you know, take root in your mind? Yeah, so uh when I became the pastor, I would uh I, the way that I would refer to myself looking back, okay, I didn't even know this terminology then, but I was a neo-evangelical. Uh okay. yeah. my definition of a neo-evangelical is 
you're never going to fault him for anything that he says. There's just a lot of things he's not going to say. Mm. A lot of places he's not going to go, you know. And so, uh, you know, in my earlier years being in Southern California, I was heavily influenced by uh, John MacArthur, not personally, just right. via tape. If you would have come yeah, to my... Yeah, everywhere. He was prevalent. Oh, yes, yeah. man. And if you would have come to my singles class, it would have uh, sounded a whole lot like John MacArthur with funny stories. Mm. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, I was learning about expository preaching. And so that right. I had that value early on. Uh, but, you know, through some of these weird stops along the way, um, you know, don't didn't really have a say in what was going on in the church. So when I became the pastor in New Philly, uh, I had heard of Jeff Adams because of missions. He had come to do a one night gig uh, for missions. God used him tremendously in my life mm -hmm. on that that night. This and was a new. He came to New Philly. To new preach, Philly, yeah. and even before yeah. I was the pastor. Okay. And so after I became the pastor, I started hearing about this church in Kansas City that, you know, where Jeff Adams was the pastor. And I'm hearing about the hundreds of people that are sitting down on a weekly basis and discipling and being discipled and the mission trips that were happening and people going all over the world. The, the, the Bible Institute, Shepherd School of Ministry back in the day, uh, and the people that are being trained and being sent out. And, you know, wow, I'm, I'm like, you know what? That sounds like what the church is supposed to be about. Right. And so uh, I, I made a trek to Kansas City, and I, I obviously had called ahead to just say, hey, could I just come and talk to some of you guys about what's going on there? And, uh, and, and they were gracious enough to say, dude, come on. And uh, so, uh, you know, as I spent time uh, with the, the leaders there, they were all talking, uh, you know, about the, the place of discipleship and how discipleship is what fuels everything else that was going on, in, right. you know, missions and the, the hunger for the word and just, you know, all of those th kinds of things. And so I knew that they were these King James people, you know, and uh, of course. and being a neo-evangelical. Now, I, I didn't use a different version. I always used the King James, but I certainly didn't want to be one of those King James people. Yeah, it wasn't a part of the conversation. Oh, yeah, yes. But I knew that Kansas City Baptist Temple, they, they did that King James thing. And so I was intrigued about the everything that they had going, not realizing that it was actually because of the authority of the Bible that was fueling even discipleship. Right. And so... Uh, so as I was talking with the leaders, I was like, uh, uh, okay, uh, I don't know how to say this, but okay, so like if we did have, you know, they were talking about bringing a team in. I was like, if, if we did bring a team in, um, are you guys going to do this King James thing on us? And, uh, you know, I, I was actually talking with uh, Jeff Adams and uh Oh, no more. Uh, you know, our people are trained uh, very, uh, you know, we're very dogmatic about the fact that we don't want anybody pressing that issue. Uh, it'll all be about discipleship. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's cool. Uh, and so we went to Arthur Bryant's not long. Good, good I mean, call. Yeah, right, right after this conversation. So when we're at Arthur Bryant's, I, uh, I said, so... Um, Tell me about this King James issue. What's what is the deal with that? And uh, he was very wise in the way that he approached me on it. You know, again, I've already played my hand. Sure. Want to make sure we don't become those King James people, right? And so he said, "You know what, Mark? One of these days, you're going to have to answer a question, and the question is, do I have a Bible?" And so. I'm, I'm going, 
oh, I don't know what he means, and I'm going to look <laughs> stupid right now because I don't know what in the heck he's talking about. Right. And so I couldn't think of anything smart to say, and so I said, okay, uh, I, I have a Bible, uh, but I don't think that's what you're asking. I, I don't know what you mean, do I have a Bible? Okay, obviously I have a Bible. And he said, well, I, I've never heard you preach, but I would imagine that if I were to come to New Philly and listen to you preach, somewhere probably once a year, you would stand before your people and you would hold your Bible in your hand and you would point to it and you would say, we believe that the Bible is the inspired, infallible, inerrant Word of God. And you'd get big amens out of everybody in the room. But if I were to come up to you after the service and say, now, Mark, when you were talking about the inspired, infallible, and errant Bible, were you talking about the one you were pointing to and holding in your hand? And he said, I, I would guess that what you would tell me is, well, this is a reliable translation, but the inspired, infallible, and errant one is in the original manuscripts. Mm. And so that's what I mean when I ask you, do you have a Bible? Because if it's in the original manuscripts, they don't exist. And so you really don't have a Bible. And wow, that made all the sense in the world to me. Now that didn't make me a King James guy, but what it did is it sent me on the search and I about killed myself for real. Mm. Uh, two years of trying to weed through church history to make sense of all of it. Um, it became an obsession. Oh, yes, absolutely. I wanted a Bible, man. I, I mean, and so that was revolutionary, uh, getting the authority of the Bible in my life and uh, actually believing it. It changed my preaching because the authority was outside of myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that, that's the deal with a neo-evangelical. Why he doesn't say things is he doesn't feel like he has the authority to say it. But if God's saying it, and this is his book, then man, say it. Right, right. And so the people in New Philly, man, that were back there in the old days, they saw that whole transition happen, and they were making it at the same time that I was. <clears throat> and that was going to be my next question is, um, you know, so you're t gaining this position as it concerns God's Word. And then you're also adopting a philosophy of discipleship. That's new. All these things are new. Uh, there's a lot of churches uh, that that pastors in our fellowship have taken over, uh, or maybe planted churches, and building a philosophy of discipleship, building a uh, an understanding or a concept that this is the infallible Word of God. That's not an easy task. There's a lot of prayer that goes into that. There's a lot of one-on-one um, -on -one conversations that you're having with people who have doubts. What was that, what was that like? I mean, was that really hard? Or, well, as I started into that whole study of church history, uh, it didn't take me long to get to understand. Yes, God was supernaturally working to give the world an infallible standard that you could hold in your hands. And uh, so what I did, I, it was probably premature, but God in His grace blessed it unbelievably. I started taking them on a journey through Revelation 2 and 3 uh, as the outline for church history. And uh, wow. It was the most incredible time of my entire life because it was uh, for our people. What they were, would tell me back in the day is, I feel like it's a soap opera, man. It ends and we can't wait to hear what the next part is. Yeah, that's awesome. Yes, and I was preaching way too long, but not a person was you know, doing anything other than taking copious notes and, you know, and, and because I didn't want to just present this the way that 
a lot of times King James people do. They don't mm-hmm. know why they believe what why they believe sure. the book. Sure. And so, dude, I w- I was giving them seven pages of notes with footnotes and quotes and all kinds of yeah. You things. literally took them on the journey with you. Oh, it, yeah. for sure. Yeah. And it which would, was probably dangerous and exciting at the same time. Oh yes, yeah. it was. It was scary as all get out. But man, I could just see right from the get go. Wow, they are loving getting a, a, their heads wrapped around. So it. then, I mean, there's again, there's a lot to say about that. In fact, this will be a plug, because two years ago at the Certainty Conference, the 2018 conference, you taught probably a synthesized version of that journey that you went on and you you used revelation chapter two and three and you taught some his church history and you talked about why we believe that the king james is god's uh, authoritative word uh for us uh, today so that's a plug for that if people wanted to go back and listen to the certainty conference from 2018 all that's available on the living faith fellowship website and so I, i invite people to do that um but okay, so discipleship. Though. Yes, and uh, man, so, I, I so got so do you on di- that side what did you do? You disciple? Did you disciple one person or a, a group of people, and then and then you train them how to disciple? Uh, that had to have been a slow beginning. Well, uh, here here was the deal. So back in those days at Kansas City Baptist Temple, what what they were suggesting, you know, because I'm like, tell me what to do, you know, and they said, well, what we would suggest is bring a team in. And uh, let us jumpstart your ministry. And we, you know, we will bring one of our pastors. He'll uh, start on a Sunday and go through a Wednesday. Uh, He'll do the first, you know, our, our goal every night for the first hour. Our people will sit down with your people for the next two hours, bring them through the lessons and show them how we take the lessons to accomplish the goal and, you know, Mm. all of those kinds of things. And so I was like, dude, that would be awesome. And so, again, it just blew me away. They uh, sent 50 of their people. Wow. uh, That's a big team. At their own expense. Yes, it it was a large church and we had, you know, people were, they showed up, you know, and so... uh, so they they did that, in, and at the end of it, it was a natural divide. You know, there were people that were uh, fairly grounded in the word. That you know, with having the tools and being able to see, they would the have goal. been ready. Yes, and so what we said is, you know, we'll give you a little more training on, on all of this. But if you feel like you're ready to go, then check this box. If you got overwhelmed this week and you said, dude, I'm, I'm more clueless than I thought I was, and check that box and we'll connect you with the people that sure. uh, feel like they're ready. And so, wow, uh, it, it, it worked like a charm. Man. And so, you know, I mean, we, from the get-go, we had a hundred people involved in discipleship um, you know, 50, it, it, having 50 that they were building into. And so that was that was slow at that point. And as it began to grow, uh, you know, we had ministries all over the place doing all kinds of things, but we weren't doing the one thing. And so people, you know, as they're bringing these excuses, I'm just thinking to myself, you know, what are we going to do with, you know, I mean, they've only got so much time in, in their schedule. And so, you know, I, we just started, I, first we shot the choir and orchestra, then we started shooting all of these other things, taking the life supports off grandma, you know, uh, I, I, a lot of the programs that go on in a church is to yeah, give there's the a tradition. F- yes. So so and so did this, or you know, we've been yes. doing this for twenty years. Yeah. Right. And in in my estimation, you don't really have life in the body, and so you get these little programs to give the appearance of life. So anyway, I, I told our folks, listen, he left us one thing to do, and if we don't do anything else, we're going to get to the judgment seat of Christ, and let's do the one thing that he left us to do. So as we did that, then we started bringing in real ministries. That supported uh, discipleship. Exactly. 
And now there's a there's a church in New Philadelphia. It's been there for over 100 years, 150 years, right? Uh, it's uh, it was 1858, oh and goodness. so it's 161 right now. It's an it's an old congregation who gained a philosophy of discipleship that they have held to 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 today. And Pastor Jeff Bartell is doing you know as God gives him grace a masterful job. Of, oh my of, goodness! Of yes. holding the torch of discipleship, and Absolutely. they've got they still. You know the church that God used you in. Now He's using Jeff to to lead an, another generation of disciple makers. Amen. So in the next episode, uh, I want to hear your weird stories. Okay, you, you said you had some weird stories to tell us, but also I want to hear, and I think they have to do with with ministry and things that you've learned over the years in ministry. So I want to hear about that. So we'll save that for the next episode, if that's okay awesome. with you. Yeah. You know what? I mean, uh, some of those weird things have actually uh, played into everything that I feel like the Lord has taught me through the years to, uh, for ministry's sake. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing about that. So, cool. Pastor Mark Trotter, thank you for being with us, and thank you for joining us for another episode of The Postscript. Uh, if you've got questions about Living Faith Bible Institute, visit lfbi.org. Uh, if you're interested in Living Faith Fellowship, maybe you've heard us talking about Living Faith Fellowship and, and that piqued your interest, uh, please visit lffellowship.com and you can learn more about our loose network of churches uh, that believe in discipleship, uh, believe in training our members and sending them out to plant churches all over the world. That's our heartbeat. And so if that in intrigues you at all, uh, please check that out as well. Again, we thank you and we're, we're praying that these episodes would be edifying to you, that they build you up and strengthen you, encourage you in God's word, but also in your ministry. Thanks for joining us.